like the turn off the between classes. Not the whole computer. Talk to you betray me. Um how is everybody today? Life goes on. list 
then insert will insert it at the end, I think. Or maybe it'll insert at one before the end. Maybe, I don't know. We'd have to check. If you want to remove an element, delete it from the list, this, um, the remove function is your boy. Return an element i and delete it. So pop is like a remove, but it also returns the element that you're, uh, that you're deleting. And reverse just takes it and swaps it. So the point of all of this is that these operations will modify the list itself um, without ref, like without creating a new version of the data structure. So if we take a look and at our handy diet Python free terminal, if we have a list, uh, list one, two, three, four, five, there we go. L dot pen six. Nothing is returned that we're viewing anyway, but if we take a look at L, six is in there. However, if we take L from two to three, for example, L itself has not been modified. If we overwrite L with the sliced, uh, the, the results of the slicing operation, it looks like we're modifying the data, like it looks like we're modifying the data structure. But really all we're doing is we're creating a new data structure from the old one and then overwriting the old one with the new one. That's a different thing than using these mutation operations. Make sense? Okie dokie. The references get broken. So if I were to do that, right, um, let me just show you something interesting quickly. Uh, let's convert that to hexadecimal. Oh, no, 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 no. Friggin' not block. Jeez. There we go. So, <clears throat> this is going to be relevant to a discussion we're going to have in a couple of slides. I know I have a habit of just kind of like pouncing on material before we're even to the slide for it, but you know, just go with it. Um, the ID function allows you to view the memory location at which a particular element is stored. Right? So when I say IDL, and then I view that as a hexadecimal number, this is the memory address where that element is being stored. Right? You can uniquely identify data structures by comparing their identification numbers. Or, or, or we would, in, in other languages, say you compare the pointers to the data structures to see if you're actually pointing at the same data structure. So, um, for example, if I have another list, m, which is different in nature, then id of m, you'll notice these things are stored in similar but not the same memory. Right? So, when you take an operation such as this, L is equal to a slice from 1 to 5 of L, and then we view the identification number of L, you will notice that the identification number has changed. This is a new data structure. In, located in a new and different part of computer memory. Question? So what happens to the old data? It is deleted. It, it, you no longer have access to it. Um, essentially, the uh, more advanced answer, um, programming languages that'll, that do this sort of thing, um, well, more advanced languages, have subroutines called garbage collection. right? So, data in the absence of context is meaningless. The old version of L will still be in memory, but there's no pointer to it. Right? The program does not have any means of accessing that data. Right? However, that data is still allocated to the program. So, you have garbage collection routines. Uh, one of the things that garbage collection does is it 
checks the status of all of the memory that has been allocated to your program, right? And if you have any memory that has no pointer to it, it's like, well, you're clearly finished with that, so I'm just going to go recycle that memory. And uh, so it goes poof, bye-bye. <laughs> Eventually. Although it's like it's not like garbage collection is run after every line of code. It's run every so often as the program is run. Make sense? Any other questions? Yes. So the variable like the pointer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you know what a pointer is, awesome. That'll help you out a lot. The name of any data structure in Python just by itself is a pointer. That is to say, you can think of this guy here as being a memory address, where um, you know the indexing operation is a dereferencing operation. But you know this is kind of getting beyond the scope of the course uh, for the advanced students in the class only. Um, you don't have to know what a pointer is, but you do have to know that you do have unique identity unique identifiers contained inside of these variables representing data structures and it's possible to um, it's possible to play with them a bit to get some interesting results right so this is a con in, in Python we call this aliasing uh, it might go by other names in other uh, in other programming languages but so let's say we had a data structure n, and we assign that, we assign m to n. So m is this, n is also that. A naive programmer might believe that what we have done is copy the data structure. We have not. All we have done is copy the reference to the data structure. So, in consequence, if I perform m.append 7, you can see that 7 has been appended to m, and if I view n, you'll notice that the same modification has occurred. N is an alias of M. Question. Um, I'm not familiar with the borrowing concept in Rust. How does it work? Uh, so you make a reference to the other variable or whatever. What is it? Well, um, it sounds like it is. I would have to. Uh, I would have to. Um, you know, look into it to be able to give you a definitive. Um, yes? Yes. Um, so Python's interpreter has been written in C. And uh, a lot of what Python does is actually C operations given different names. Um, so yeah, in this case, we're basically creating a pointer to first element of the, of the data structure rather than, you know, creating a copy of the data structure. Make sense? So the question is, one question you may have, if I can't copy a data structure using an assignment operation, how might I be able to do it? There are various ways of doing it, but any operation which um, performs a non-mutating, like any non-mutating operation which produces a copy of the data structure as a byproduct will be what you want in that situation. Um, there is a deep copy library in Python, which you can use. Um, I find the uh, simplest way of doing it is say O is equal to N from the beginning to the end. I don't think we talked about slicing operations yet with respect to leaving these guys blank. But if you leave the first one blank, it means from the beginning. And if you leave the second one blank, it means to the end. So this is a slice from the beginning to the end, which is, of course, just the data structure, right? So if we take a look at O, there we go. 
if we m dot append something else, oh, there we go, m has 10, n has 10, o does not. The link has been broken. If we uh, take a look at the uh, identification numbers for m, n, and o, you'll notice that m and n both share an identification number, but o does not. Make sense? You guys following so far? This is good? Good, good? Eh. Eh. Hopefully not for me. Okay, question. Oh, uh, I With an integer? Yeah. yeah, it has to be a data structure. Yeah, so I tried a equals 3 and b equals a. Yeah, no, the, the, the same thing does not apply to integers. Uh, it applies to data structures because uh, of the way that um, data structures are stored. No, um, it would be kind of silly for Python. It would be silly even for Python to make every integer variable name a, 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 a pointer to, a bear, to, a, to an integer rather than the integer itself. That being said, you can still do the identification. I'm pretty sure you can still do ID over it. Uh, that will get you the memory reference, but you know, in the absence of a dereferencing operation, it probably has a dereferencing operation, but you know, it's just there be dragons. Don't worry about that. Make sense? Okay. Um, so the question you may be having, and another question you may be having in your brains, in the middle of your brain meat. Why am I kid, why am I telling you any of this? This seems like pretty advanced stuff. Right? Well, you guys remember what the uh, semantics for passing arguments are in Python? We use pass by, yeah, not pass by reference, not pass by value, pass by assignment. There's an implicit assignment operation that goes on behind the scenes whenever you're passing information into a function. Assignment has different meanings depending on the context. In the context of data structures, assignment means you're creating a duplicate reference to the same data structure. That means, therefore, when you're passing a data structure into a function, any modifications that that function makes to the data structure will be visible outside the data structure, or outside of the function, pardon me. This might mean that you have unintended consequences and side effects, right? If you write a lovely little algorithm that takes a list and processes it by deleting everything in the list, and then you expect to have that later, that list later, after the function has executed, perhaps you expect to execute that function multiple times over the data structure, it will have been deleted by the time it gets to the next iteration. This uh, kind of falls once again into our uh, well-traveled heuristic. Do not modify inputs because you don't know what people are doing with them in the, in the you know, sort of behind the scenes. Make sense? Will you heed my words of warning? Like, I realize that, like, some, sometimes I seem to go off on these abstruse tangents, but what I'm actually trying to do is to protect you against some of the common pitfalls. And, um, I don't know, I feel like you guys deserve, a, like, a proper explanation for why things go on, rather than just saying, do this, don't do that, memorize all my stupid rules, you know? Um, if you actually understand why the stupid rules are in place, then you, they aren't stupid anymore. So, um, 
Like, do this, do that, don't murder people. So anyway, um, I've kind of already done this example, but, uh, you know. Oh, here's, okay, here's one thing from the slide. Concatenation, right? Is that mutating or non-mutating, do you think? They're like, well, I'm sure you're going to tell us. Now is it non is it mutating or non-mutating? Non-mutating. And uh, you can uh, you can add an empty list. You can concatenate with an empty list, right? And that I think also serves the same purpose as doing the with the colon in the middle, the slicing. So ID at L, ID at T. Yeah, they're different. So there you go. That's another way of doing the same thing. Good. Um, you can have references to other lists in the middle of lists as well. Um, so another way of saying that is because lists are not monotyped, they can contain any type of object which exists in Python, the, um, these guys, these variables which point to data structures, can also be elements of lists, although they won't be explicit, like there won't be an explicit name in there, it'll be like B1 is also a, a data structure, right? And they can alias other things, and I don't recommend that um, at all. I'm going to skip this one because it's just, you can see the answer from the cloud diagram, you know? What is the value of E at the end? E is B0. B0 references this data structure. The zeroth element is 5. Boom. Right? So. so let's talk about slicing in somewhat more detail. <coughs> so in the absence of any, uh, uh, in the absence of either the first or the second parameter to the slicing operation, you assume uh, either from the beginning or to the end, respectively. So, if you want to slice, um, let me just let me just uh, I'll show you some slicing. String is equal to um, what's your favorite movie? Blade Runner isn't as good as people think it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, nobody's keeping you here. Um, so, again, from beginning to end, it's just the entire string. You can also pick some arbitrary point in the middle and go right to the end. You can also pick from the beginning to some arbitrary point in the middle. Um, so there you go. Um, if you put a third argument in there, that's how many you count by. So two, three, etc. You can get like every third element, you know, you can get every eighth element, noon. Um, and most interestingly, you can also do negative values here. So, an interesting thing about Python, which I don't think I've mentioned yet, you can actually, and this is, this is probably going to like, be like, this is very weird for all of you guys who are like seasoned Java programmers and stuff, unless Java also does this, but I don't think it does. <clears throat> Negative indexes are valid in Python. They count from the back forward. So 
If you want the last element of the array, that's negative 1, then negative 2 is the second last, negative 3 is the third last, etc., etc. The um, sort of Python shorthand for performing a non-mutating reverse operation is from beginning to end, count by negative 1. And that da -da -da -da, reverses the whole list. Yes? Excellent question. Let's see what it has. To, let's see what it does. Nothing. Okay. So it kind of it assumes uh, the slicing operation assumes that the um, it assumes that it's counting up. Yeah. So maybe if I pick like if I reverse these and I did like negative thirty to twenty. No. Negative three, negative four. There we go. Negative four, maybe like I don't know. What is the length of this bloody thing? Fifty-six. Okay, so let's try forty-six. There. Right. So even though it's been specified using negative indexing, so long as it's before the thing you're counting to, everything works. Um, you can reverse them. <clears throat> Right? But then you would have to count by some negative amount. Right? <clears throat> Make sense? Any questions about that? Yes? If, if you reverse the start and stop and you. Sorry? But, so the way this algorithm works, right, it starts at whatever you specify as the first point, and that's, uh, that, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, you're always just specifying a point in the array, right? It goes to, basically it's like an if statement. If my current position is less than the place I'm going to, I add a number and move up. Otherwise, I stop. Right? So, if your start point is actually after your end point, then it steps into it. It does that if statement. Am I, is my position less than my stopping point? It goes, no, stops, returns what it's got so far, which is nothing. So it returns an empty string. Does that make sense? Everything makes sense eventually. Question. If you do a negative number that's bigger than the length of the string, will it loop back to the end, or will it give an index out of bounds? That's a good question. Let's see what it does. Um, S at negative 100 is an index error out of range. So it doesn't loop back. It doesn't wrap around. Um, and it goes from negative 1 because you really don't want a number system with a concept of negative 0. Um, that's, actually a, that's actually a thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip that. If, we, uh, if, I ever get the if I get the opportunity, like, I don't know, I can't really do it without chalkboard, but uh, I could explain signed unsigned arithmetic to you. And, uh, you would see that it's really, it's really terrible to have a uh, concept of a negative zero. But uh, anyway, so lists are like uh, tuples are like lists, but immutable. So no aliasing and faster. Why are they faster? Because a tuple cannot be modified, it's the amount of memory that it takes up is fixed at its creation. Right? It does not require any fancy tricks to be able to expand itself over time. 
So, um, essentially, you're dealing with the difference between an array and a linked list. But, you know, you guys will, you'll get there eventually. Um, I'm not expecting you to, uh, to, to be able to do that yet, but, you know, anyway. So, let's talk about sets, all right? You guys did, uh, have you guys done set theory in high school? Not even a little bit? Not even a teensy little bit of set, set theory? Yes? You did? Oh. You're like the only guy who will admit it, so. Um, man, what are they teaching you guys in high school these days? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting that strong impression. Like, I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the great stay home didn't help things, but, uh, um, you know, the great snow day, can we call it the great snow day? That was like a, two years long. Um, so, all right. You guys, are you guys taking uh, 1DM3 this semester? Is that next semester? All right, you'll get, you'll get plenty of set theory then. Um, so, all right, I'm going to lay some facts on you. The, your chosen discipline uses, as its mathematical base, set theory, not calculus. This means that the better you know set theory, the better you will do in this program. Period. All right? Given that you're not being taught it until next semester, although I'm sure 1JC3 will, you know, come close to it at, at times, um, I'd like to recommend a book <laughs> for you to study over reading week. It's quite short. Um, it's Paul Thomas's Naive Set Theory. It's a book from the 1960s, um, but this is the type, like, there may be a few slight notational differences between the way they did things in the 60s and the way they, they do things now. But this is basically like, uh, you know, this is, if you take this book and you read it and you study it and you understand it, you will be able to ace your courses reasonably well, at least, you know, insofar as you won't have that barrier of not knowing what the heck set theory even is. Yes? Could you just repeat the text? Yeah, it's Paul Halmus Naive Set Theory. Here, I'll, uh, I'll show it to you on the Amazon. Paul Halmus Naive Set Theory. Um, yeah, you don't have to get an expensive one. Um, yeah, this will do. No, that's a Jesus <laughs> Christ. Okay. There's like a, there's, I, I, I saw a paperback version. Yeah, it's not too bad. Obviously, you can get online versions of it as well. It's a very old book. But, um, yeah. What you want is a reprint of the original 1960 edition, please. Um, but, yeah. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> Why is set theory important for, math, for, for this type of mathematics? Um, so, when you get into third year and you start studying the mathematical foundations of programming languages, how programming languages are designed, how type systems are designed, all of this kind of stuff, um, and I'm, you know, saying this primarily because I've taught that course in the past, so I know from experience. The mathematics that underpin all of that study are sets, functions, relations, um, you know, equivalence relations, properties such as transitivity and symmetricality, you know. All of these things, which I don't have the time or space to teach you in 1MP3 because we've got to teach you guys Python, we've got to get you at least programming first. Um, all of these things, you know, um, things which are elements of sets, set unions, um, constructions of sets using induction, all of these types of things, these are the things that you will need to be conversant in if you're going to, uh, you know, 
have any hope of getting into grad school. Um, so, especially for computer scientists, like the software engineers can get away with just implementing stuff because they're you know software engineers and you know you know uh, whereas computer scientists are you know masters of the high maths. Um, software engineers are a bunch of hairy knuckled apes who just have to get stuff working. Um, speaking as a hairy knuckled ape myself, um, so since you're in computer science, I expect you to be interested in mathematics, and that's the mathematics you should be interested in. Okay? So over the break, get yourself a copy of Palmas. You know, read at least the first four chapters. A chapter being no more than five pages in that book. Like it's it's very short, so you should be able to get through it on the break. But you know, if you do that, you, things will go well. If you do that, if you don't do that, things will go less well. Please take my advice. Anyway, so, and I'm saying this primarily because like I've just received very strong indication from the crowd that you have had no background in set theory whatsoever. So. Uh, so what is what the frig is a set then? Why what 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 the heck even, man? This is really heavy for a Wednesday morning. Um, <clears throat> so a set is a collection of objects, with or without repetition, despite the the uh, definition on the slide, depends on the set. Sometimes repetition is allowed, sometimes they're not. So it's just a collection of things, right? So, you know, for example, the, the integers are a set, right? All of the numbers, positive, negative, off to infinity, that's a set. The natural numbers, you guys know what the natural numbers are? Hopefully. Um, Starting at zero, going off to positive infinity, counting by ones, right? The natural numbers are a subset of the integers, right? So every natural number is an integer, but not every integer is a natural number, right? The real numbers are a superset of the integers. Every integer is a real number, not every real number is an integer, right? The booleans are a set with a domain consisting of two objects, true and false, in combination with a bunch of operations, right? So when you start getting into the more advanced, you know, set theories, you can define algebras, all right? The, like, you guys have probably never heard the word algebra used in the plural sense, right? Well, the algebra that you guys have been taught all through school is one of many, all right? There's a reason we call it Boolean algebra, right? It is a specific set of operations which apply to the domain of Boolean values, or the set of Booleans, right? So, what you, uh, a carrier set, which is to say a set of values, in combination with a set of operations over that values, or you might say functions starting in that set of values and resulting in that set of values, that is an algebra. So you can define your own algebras. Um, one that you'll probably see later on, uh, if you haven't seen it already in 1JC3, is called piano arithmetic. Um, it turns out that all you require in order to define the natural numbers is zero and a successor function. Ah, you guys have heard of the successor functions. Yes. Um, so you can get to any natural number via a successor and, uh, and you know, some base starting off point, right? Um, you guys are learning Haskell right now. 
Have they talked? Have they told you about lambda calculus? Yeah. Lambda calculus is another one, right? You can define lambda calculus. Um, you know, technically lambda calculus doesn't need values because functions can also be values. But the set of all functions is what's defined by lambda calculus, right? Um, but anyway, I digress. That's not sets in Python. <laughs> but uh, so at the, at, the, at the kind of like the, the high school or what used to be the high school set theory level. Um, I read for the future of Western civilization. <laughs> You've got uh, a few basic set operations which allow you to perform, you know, some, you can calculate sets from other sets, right? So if you have two sets and you perform the union of those two sets, you derive a third set containing all of the elements which are in B and all of the elements which are in A. The intersection of two sets is all of those elements which are in both A and B. So union, all those elements which are in either A or B. Notice the Boolean language, right? Intersection, all those elements that are in both A and B. Notice the Boolean language. We also have difference, which uh, if you, it's like set subtraction. If you take A and you take, uh, like A difference B are all of those elements in A which are not in B, right? So if you imagine A as being a, a, a circle and B as being an overlapping circle uh, in sort of Venn diagram fashion. By the way, this is where Venn diagrams come from. Um, the difference is like a cookie with a bite taken out of it, where B was the bite. Make sense? Yeah, oh, I should, have, I should have mentioned that before. Basically, anytime you see a Venn diagram, it's people being less mathematically rigorous, but using the ideas from set theory. Cardinality is the number of distinct elements in a set. Um, in Python, we use the length function to denote cardinality. Make sense? Any questions? I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at you at the moment, but again, I think you guys deserve to know, you know how things actually are. Yes? You said union has a state or B, right? Yeah. But they're not applied to yeah. Um, it's a new set containing all the elements in, in A and all the elements in B, right? So if an element is in A or it's in B, then it's in the union. Uh, or, yeah, the union. The the no, this intersect is the middle of the Venn diagram. This is both circles, in the, including the, inter uh, the, the overlap. Maybe if I just like do a few operations in Python, then we'll, that might be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or, I can use my dice. Ooh. All right. I was doing sorting algorithms with the two C O three, two C O three. Yeah, it's today. So, all right. So these are objects, right? These objects can be categorized into a number of different sets, right? The blue dice are a set, the yellow dice are a set, the green dice are a set, the red dice are a set. Uh, we can also categorize them as, in sets based on the face values that are facing you uh, on each of these dies, right? So, if I were to take yellow union six, right, that would be yellow union six. If 
if I were to take green intersect 3, just that one, because it's both green and 3. Does that make sense? If I took red difference 2, that would be those guys. This is red, you know, this is 2, so you take out the 2s. And things that aren't in red, you don't care about. Make sense? Any, uh, any questions? Cool. Um, getting pretty late, but uh, let's just see. I think I can probably, uh, yeah, let's just do that in Python quickly. And I'll, uh, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you these operations in Python. So, to create a set in Python, you use curly braces. So, s is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's make another set t, which is equal to um, 3, 4, 5, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? So s, 1 through 5, t, 3 through 7. s, union, t. Union is the vertical bar character. 1 through 7. s, intersect, t, 3 through 5. s, difference, t, 1 and 2. Start to make sense? Good. Once you get into sort of more advanced languages or different lower level languages, the vertical bar character is normally associated with the OR operation. In C, one vertical bar means bitwise OR, two vertical bars means Boolean OR. Right? In the same way, the ampersand character represents AND operations. A single one is a bitwise AND operation. Two ampersands is Boolean AND. So where in Python you actually type the word AND, uh, you use two ampersands in most other languages. Does that make sense? Okay. I think that's, I think that's enough damage for today. See you next time.